Um, first, have any of you been to the Jewish Museum? Raise your hands. A few people, wait, great. Um, so the number one question I always get when people, when people know that I work at the Jewish Museum is where is the Jewish Museum? And having worked at the Guggenheim before, um, I can let you know that it's three blocks north um, <laughs> from 89th Street, so on 92nd and 5th Avenue um, across from Central Park. I've been working in museums now for over a decade, specifically on digital initiatives. And my job addresses the question of how we can use technology to make museums and art more accessible as a design solution so that we can reach more people. But to a lot of people, when I say I'm the director of digital, these very sexy keywords pop up and it's not what I do. Um, <laughs> So rather than being in the business of designing shiny products, you know, kind of implementing technology for the sake of technology, my job is actually about using technology to think about my role as a translator, an interpreter, and a problem solver. And why do you think we need translation in the art world? So a lot of times when you look at wall text at a museum, you see words like this that make no sense. Um, our press releases and our interpretive media is often unintelligible to the public because these are written by art historians who assume that they're really just speaking to themselves. <laughs> and they are. Um, but on the other hand, as technologists, we can be just as alienating in our language. So we use terms that are you know, acronyms that make no sense to people who are historians. And so in my role as a museum technologist, we have to be fluent in both art and technology. The idea of museums and technology is also a bit of a paradox because technology is new and museums are not. Whereas innovation and technology is always about iterating and creating something that's looking towards the future, the mission of a museum, if you think about it, is thinking about how we preserve the objects of our time for generations to come to better understand ourselves through the past. And something else that we have to always keep in mind is the fact and the reality that museums are not technology companies. They're not startups. We're not here to invent any new things. We're here to leverage what's been built already to reach more audiences. And so when I approach any project, I always ask the question, if technology is the answer, what was the question? What are the problems we're actually trying to solve at hand? So the problem <laughs> at most museums is this. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have actually used a museum app when you go into a museum? Um, typically, they're used as audio guides. Very few of you, um, thank you for, for um, just pretending. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I know they've been you know, very helpful didactic tools for some. Um, but honestly, we know that um, you know, in the age of apps, we're now in this very post-app environment. So maybe you know, 10 years ago when the App Store opened, Apple coined the term, there's an app for that because there really was an app for every single thing, including every museum. But what happened to all of those apps? So for the average iPhone user, we download over 100 apps in our phone, but we use less than a quarter of them. And after downloading most apps, less than 77% of its users are retained. And we also see that our top five apps take up most of our time. So here's my phone and how I use technology. As you can see, I spend a lot of time on Instagram and zero time on museum apps. <laughs> Um, so, at the Jewish Museum, we also caught the app fever for a moment, and by we, I mean people who worked there before me, before I arrived. Um, so this is my phone when I got there, so for some reason someone thought it would be a great idea to create a new app for every single exhibition audio guide, and so every six months we would release a new app that you had to download, and of course none of that content was available anywhere else, it was locked inside of the app. Um, we also, unlike other museums, did not have an institutional app that we kept updating over time. And of course, as operating systems change, uh, these were also not updated. So that could not ha continue to happen. Um, so some of the obvious challenges that a lot of museums face um, 
are these. So of course, apps are a huge barrier to entry. You have to enter a space that has a shitty Wi-Fi infrastructure and then have to like wait to download your app and it takes up all the space. It becomes a very disjointed museum experience. And of course, what we saw um, with our front of house staff was that most of the people working at the front desk, they were spending all their time teaching people how to reset their iTunes passwords <laughs> instead of teaching them about art. So that also did not work. Um, and let's just get real, nobody wants to download a museum app. So at the Jewish Museum about two years ago, um, we completely redesigned our collection display. Um, so for those of you who haven't been to the museum, before that, 25 years ago, we had a very traditional linear interpretation of the history of art. Um, so you would go through from antiquities to contemporary art, and most recently re-examined uh, re our collection to think about thematic connections between objects, um, kind of conveying this idea, this new museology idea that all art was once contemporary and we can have interesting connections that are made between time and place. So here's one example. This is the main gallery where we have a massive, beautiful painting by the artist Kahinda Wiley, who's most well known for doing Barack Obama's official portrait. So that is on your right. And on the left is a 19th century Ukrainian Mizra. It's a Jewish ritual object. And the artist actually went to our website, found this object, and painted it into the background of this painting. So that's really what inspired this portrait. And both of them are now on view at the museum. And that's really what distinguishes the Jewish Museum from other institutions. Here, um, not here, but um, at the Jewish Museum, our objects tell stories. All of our objects once belonged to someone. Um, they tell the story of life and experiences, really for people of all backgrounds. So how do we tell these stories? Um, so for people who don't want to read the wall text and also don't know any background about contemporary art or Jewish culture, two very different subject matters, but with the lowest barrier to entry. Audio guides have always been the most impactful way and kind of the most innovative technology of its time when they first came out. And it's still relevant because audio is the power of using a portal to tell stories and storytelling. And they also give you the impression that the curator or the artist is there walking you through the gallery. Um, and it's also important to note that the experience of looking at art, we feel, is still primary in this experience. So rather than you know, this dorky gesture of holding your phone up into an object, there isn't going to be an invasive experience when you're just listening to the immersive experience of audio and really having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the art. So the art will and should continue to be the primary source of a visitor's focus, not the technology. So we approached a new project that would address all of these problems, um, and these were our goals. First, we wanted to create something that was very accessible, very easy to use. We also have a much older audience that come to the museum, um, people who sometimes minimize screens and forget where they are. Um, we also have uh, the need for people to continue to come back to the museum. Um, so our audience is also much more local as opposed to other museums in New York City that attract more tourists. From a technology perspective, um, this project was luck luckily funded through the support of Bloomberg Philanthropies, who's been a long-standing partner of the museum. Um, often what happens with funding, um, I think for people who just attended those workshops earlier during lunch, um, museums, you know, they tend to birth projects in the way that you have this singular time of injected funds because you want to build something, but no one ever wants to fund maintenance. So we also wanted to create something that would continue to be sustainable over time, that we could support on our own. My personal goal as someone who works at a museum but has never ever picked up an audio guide is to design something that I would actually use myself. So the solution we came up with was a, plas a platform agnostic mobile tour experience, and I'll explain what that means. Um, so we wanted to make sure all of our content would be accessible and streaming across all of our different platforms, not just mobile, but also when people visit our website and also come on site and maybe don't have a device on their own. In the year 2019, of course, most people do bring their own phones to a museum, and from surveys we know that over 90% of our visitors do. 
But a very specific factor that is very specific to the Jewish Museum is that on Saturdays, where a majority of our, vis our visitation occurs, um, admission is free, but we also are an institution that observes the Sabbath, the Jewish day of rest. So the museum is open, but we don't accept admission. However, we also can't hand out technology or devices or have anything interactive. So we also needed to address a solution that would address 40% of people who would come for free. So this was the problem. <laughs> How do we hack the Sabbath? <laughs> Wi-Fi is the lowest common denominator of digital experiences. Um, so because um, technically, for people who aren't observant, we can encourage them to use their own phones and bring their own devices and use technology in their galleries. Um, we wanted to make sure this infrastructure was in place. So we implemented a major uh, upgrade of our, all of our Wi-Fi networks, tripled the number of access points in the building. Um, we're also leveraging the power of the Wi-Fi system to collect data from visitors. So when you sign in, we can collect your email address and continue to keep in touch. All the data goes into our CRM. Um, and this is the interface where we take your information. Automatically, you're redirected to um, a page that will take you to streaming audio guides on a web-based platform where you don't have to download an app. Um, we also, about a year ago, set all of our content free that used to live on those apps that were locked away. Um, so now all of our audio guides are also streaming on SoundCloud, a very cost-efficient um, but widely accessible way of uh, uploading all of our archive back online. So you can now also listen to audio on our website. And this is a project that we just launched last week at the museum, but it's also available off-site on any uh, mobile web browser. Um, so if you go to tours.thejewishmuseum.org, um, we develop what's called a single page application, which basically means it gives you the functionality of an app without having to download an app. So it's basically a web app. Um, you can access it on any mobile device um, or any browser. The design is also responsive based on the type of phone you have. And we borrowed from the language of apps that people are familiar with. So thinking about Spotify that has a very singular purpose of providing audio in a playlist. Um, so we took a very simplified user interface and adapted it for our needs for looking at images. So here's a walk through what we put together. Um, so when you go to our website, um, tours.thejewishmuseum.org, there are three different ways of exploring our exhibitions. Um, so you can do something that's more thematic based on different artists and their perspectives. For the more traditional audio guide user, you can continue to input the number that you see on the wall. And that will give you a result of someone speaking about that object. Um, or you can navigate by floor. We're not a very big museum, so it's also a very deliberate decision to not implement beacons or anything that would really drain your phone battery. Um, so we really just decided to create a wayfinding tool for people to determine what floor, um, what shows were on each floor. So in addition to the technology infrastructure, we also wanted to completely rethink our content strategy. So rather than think about um, your traditional audio tour where you have the experts or curators telling you about a single way of looking at something, why not hear from the artists? So we invited artists from our collection, um, Isaac Mizrahi, uh, Kahinda Wiley, um, Alex and Myra Kalman, Arlene Chiquette, um, to talk about their own work in the collection, but also other works that inspire them. We also developed tours for visitors with disabilities, as well as kids and families. And here's a sample of one of the pieces. Um, so this is a painting by an artist named Mel Bachner. And a curator could tell you that he was an artist um, who was part of the conceptual art movement of the 1960s, and he focused his career on the cerebral and visual association of words. But for me personally, I'd rather hear what Isaac Misrahi has to say about it. Let's see if this works. Oh, we worked so hard to get the audio on. Is it playing? 
Okay, you'll have to imagine and then just go. <laughs> okay, you guys all have to do it on your own then. Sorry. Um, so I'm often asked, my, the second most frequently asked question when I tell people I work at the Jewish Museum is, are you Jewish? Um, and the answer is no, you don't have to be Jewish to work at the Jewish Museum. We're a museum of, for people of all backgrounds. And in that same vein, our approach to technology follows the same mission. So in being platform agnostic in developing a mobile solution, it's an experience that can be accessible to everyone. And no, there isn't an app for that. Thank you.